what you're doing already. It's a better piece of design. Oh, my God, I have this. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Hi. Yeah. 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 Just going to do a very, very quick introduction. So, uh, welcome to our third uh, clinic or talk this year. We've done a, a training one and a running one, and now this is our swim introduction. And uh, we're very privileged today to have Alex Costich do the talk for us. Um, I knew he was a good swimmer, but it was only when I got to send the details of what he's actually achieved that I, I suddenly realized what company we're in, especially down with the cold pool here. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let Alex talk about some of the, the kind of background that he has had, some of the achievements. Put it this way, I actually don't think I'm being It includes uh, three gold medals at the Pan American Games. Uh, lifetimes ago, lifetimes. Currently ago. holds, is it still 10 world records? Um, I don't really check them every day. I checked some the other day, and he's definitely got quite a few still going. Um, and it looks like the way that it's structured, that he's still achieving them. So uh, good luck in the future for those as well. Thank you. Um, but I'll hand straight over to Alex. So do the um, I feel like I should like stand up and bow or something. <laughs> <laughs> That introduction. I, uh, I'm really excited to be here uh, to be a part of this and to be honest I didn't know how many people would show up so uh, there's a lot more than I thought. I was expecting Dan, Amy, and maybe one other person. So, um, <laughs> in the interest of keeping it unstructured and informal I, I do have a little bit of a presentation um, but I want you guys to get out of this. Um, each and every one of you I want you to get out of it what, what you came here for so I'd rather just kind of cut to the chase, get through some of the uh, building blocks in my presentation and then open it up to Q&A and kind of let it uh, guide me as to where, where the presentation will go. So um, anyway, uh, as I said, my name is Alex Kostich. Um, I work here at Sony in creative advertising over in the Jimmy Stewart building uh, for the feature film group. And um, this is just, I kind of like slapped this together because yesterday Dan called me and was like, so do you have a presentation? And I was like, no, not really. I was going to keep it informal. He's like, you mean no PowerPoint or, or <laughs> AD? I'm like, no. So I quickly scrambled and panicked and like put something together so that I would have something. Now I'm really grateful that I did. Um, but anyway, during the day, um, I work in creative advertising um, for the International Film Group. So when we have films released overseas, um, we kind of tailor the marketing campaigns to uh, appeal to each uh, international market. And um, a couple of our recent releases after Earth. We have a domestic uh, campaign, which you may have seen all over town. And then the international campaign was markedly different. And we'll tweak things both in the print campaigns as well as the audiovisual, um, you know, the TV spots, the trailers, and the theater materials um, for each territory. Uh, so we generally come up with several different campaigns for each film uh, outside of what you might see here domestically. Um, this is another current one that we're working on. It might look very similar to you, but the domestic campaign does not feature the White House anywhere. The international campaign does have the White House in the background. Uh, the reason for that was because the film Olympus Has Fallen overseas um, did not do very well and didn't really capitalize on the White House setting, whereas for us, uh, this was one way of making the film feel fresh, even if people had uh, heard or seen the, the previous movie. You may wonder what this all has to do with swimming, but it is going to kind of come back to it. Um, Smurfs, again, we have a domestic uh, campaign featuring all the famous characters that all the uh, people loved the first time around. Internationally, though, we wanted to highlight the um, film being uh, taking place in France, so we added the Eiffel Tower and a couple other things. And uh, That's kind of what I do on a daily basis, and it involves lots of emails and very little sleep, because no matter where you are in the world, there's an office open. So even after hours at night when I go home, I'm getting emails from London and Paris and Russia and stuff about this sort of thing, so. Uh, but it is very rewarding, it's high stress. And the only reason I included Grown Ups was because it was the only campaign that I could actually almost include a swimming pool into the material. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's a water slide, but it's the closest I've gotten in 10 years, so it was kind of fun. Um, but anyway, uh, all of this work um, can be very stressful and uh, debilitating, you know. You get beat up every day, you're presenting stuff, people reject it, they have better ideas, you know, the territories are never happy with what you give them, you're always behind on your deadlines. So what is it that grounds me and keeps me uh, what Amy, likes, Amy and Michael have called like the work-life balance, and uh, that is swimming, um, which has been a part of my life for uh, 42 of my 43 years. And uh, when I'm not here in the office, I'm across the street at the Culver City Plunge, and this is kind of thanks to Instagram and photos that were candidly taken and posted.
posted unbeknownst to me. Uh, this is sort of a representation of what my mornings look like um, across the street. And uh, I really feel like getting my day started with uh, a two hour swim workout really grounds me for whatever may follow uh, from nine to seven here across, uh, across the street. Um, I do compete in open water, uh, mostly locally here in Southern California, but I also have been afforded the opportunity to travel to some cool places and do races in the Caribbean and Hawaii um, and elsewhere. Uh, but open water has kind of extended my career as a pool swimmer where I retired from uh, swimming in pools for the most part, uh, world records notwithstanding, uh, from Stanford in 1992. And then I took up ocean swimming when I moved to California as a way of kind of extending my career and sort of reinvigorating that burnout that I was feeling from just looking at a black line all day. And it's kind of uh, extended my career a lot longer than I expected. Um, the nice thing about open water is that you may not have the speed that you once had in younger times, but um, you do develop a sense of uh, experience in uh, dealing with the conditions. You get a tolerance for the cold water and the unexpected uh, things you might encounter uh, swimming in an open water swim. So uh, what I thought would be maybe a three or four year extension to an already satisfying career ended up being still with me uh, for 20 years. So uh, anyway, uh, hi, I'm Alex, no problem. Um, this is another picture just of me finishing an open water swim uh, in Southern California. You might recognize that surf. It's pretty powerful. Uh, the waves on a good day down by Hermosa, Manhattan are five to seven feet. So open water swimming doesn't just involve moving your arms and swimming in flat water. It involves knowing how to evaluate conditions on shore. And uh, I've lost many races um, tripping in the surf or having a wave uh, bowl me over. In fact, the first open water swim I ever did was down in Seal Beach, and uh, I was winning the race by a long, long way, and um, a huge wave came, but I wasn't really aware of how to uh, swim in open water, so I wasn't looking for the wave, I just kind of felt something tug me, and the next thing I knew, I was being tumbled in the surf, and uh, I looked up, and I think like three swimmers ahead of me who were way, way behind me before I had started, so they had ridden the wave, whereas I was like fighting the current, and I ended up like third in this race, and it was really a humbling experience, but that, made me realize that I was in an entirely different sport altogether. <laughs> and this also is part of open water swimming. You're not always swimming, you're actually running, because a lot of the races locally um, have a finish line that's up the surf. So another thing that I wasn't very comfortable with before, I've taken up running in the last 20 years, and I actually do that to complement my swimming, both um, from a conditioning standpoint, but also so that I know what I'm doing in that quick and often crucial 20 meters race up the beach because I've lost probably more races running up the beach than I have uh, tumbling in the surf. <laughs> um, so anyway, just a brief overview for anybody here who might be getting started or uh, is interested in taking up swimming as more of a regular form of exercise. Um, some of the advantages, uh, it helps me stay fit, obviously. Um, it keeps me calm and relatively stress-free. Um, it allows me to eat what I want when I want. That's uh, with a caveat with a little asterisk because I do that in moderation. I have a huge sweet tooth. I love to eat um, cupcakes and cookies and all sorts of stuff like that. And I'm not vegan, I'm not vegetarian, I'm not any of those things. Um, but I do allow myself indulgences and a large part of that is uh, due to the swimming that I afford myself. So I believe everything is fine in moderation within reason. Um, so that's one of the three main reasons that I swim because I love food and I love to eat and it just gives me an opportunity to indulge once in a while. Um, it provides that work-life balance um, it also helps me with insomnia. With my job, it's been really challenging fits and starts, uh, like I said, with emails coming in from all around the world at all hours. And if I get an email at nine o'clock that stresses me out, it's been really a challenge to kind of calm down and get to sleep. But I find that if I swim regularly and consistently, and even sometimes after work, if I've already done the workout in the morning and I've had a rough day and I go back to the pool at night, just for maybe a half an hour, I sleep like a baby. So. Uh, if any of you have trouble with insomnia, that's uh, a solution that I find uh, to swim late in the day, meaning after work, um, it could help resolve that issue for you. Um, it's widened my circle of friends. I've met a lot of interesting, cool people. Hopefully many of you will stay in my life after this talk. Um, it increases my enjoyment of the outdoors. I moved to California from Boston, uh, where we had winters, where all the training I did was indoors, even in the summer. 
and uh, coming out here really made me open my eyes to the uh, possibilities and the ranges California has to offer. It's a place where you can actually go skiing and swimming in the ocean on the same day, which I've never done, but um, <laughs> it is something that you can do, and so why not take advantage of it? We live in a great place. People are coming for vacation, so we're lucky to live here. Um, swimming can be done year-round, like I said. Obviously, in California, you can do it year-round outside. Um, it doesn't require a lot of startup costs. You basically need a pair of goggles and a swimsuit. It's not golf, it's not tennis, it's not scuba diving. Um, so just something to consider. And uh, it's primarily an injury-free sport. It's usually the first thing the doctor recommends you do if you have another type of injury, whether it's running or uh, weightlifting or bad back. Um, so it's a, great, it's a great sport and I've been very lucky. I've had one injury in my 42 years of competitive swimming and that was just last year, probably from old age. But uh, not a bad track record for doing it every day for most of my life. Was it a shoulder injury? It was, it was a rotator cuff. And I never had it when I was training, like seriously in college, but for some reason last year, it just flared up and uh, yeah, it was horrible. For like a month, I couldn't swim my normal uh, routine. So it really kind of upset my balance in my life. But I still went to the pool and I kind of sat on the edge and I watched my, my friends swim and I, <laughs> I actually coached. I actually learned a lot because I was able to look at people's techniques and then I would get in for maybe 10 or 15 minutes or as long as my shoulder allowed me to do what I could and I stayed conditioned but it was just seeing things from a different perspective and then when I came back I was extra happy so um, does anybody have any questions so far or any of this I've inserted a couple of fun pictures here too just to kind of um, keep the conversation interesting um, swimming does not necessarily have to be staring at a, a black line on the bottom of the pool for two hours a day because that's usually what everybody asks me about like well isn't it, isn't it boring? Isn't it better to just go to the gym, listen to an iPod on a stationary bike, or you know, go running you know, with your headphones on? And to me, you can swim in the most exotic, interesting places. This was in Singapore um, at the Marina Bay Sands Hotel, which is like a 150 meter pool on the top of three skyscrapers that connects the three um, buildings. It's a really amazing facility. Uh, this is the largest pool in the world uh, in Chile. It's called San Alfonso del Mar. It's one kilometer in each direction. And since they need to have lifeguards there, they actually have them in boats patrolling the pool, um, <laughs> in little motorized uh, boats. But they still clean the pool by hand. There's guys in the morning with those giant squeegees like connected to a hose that actually reach across with like a telescoping thing, and it's kind of interesting to watch. But, is it fresh water or? Um, it's salt water, but it's treated, so yeah. it's sort of like briny. Um, but it was pretty pretty cool to go swimming around. My dream is to like arrange an open water race there sometimes, so you can actually swim in a pool, but it would be more like open water because you wouldn't have the controlled environment of lane lines and stuff. But if you're ever in Chile, and then uh, this is in Panama City. I always like look for pools before I go someplace, whether mm -hmm. it's for work or pleasure. And you know, I I have identified some pretty neat places um, to go swim, and then it's a way of getting a workout in, but also meeting some new people and seeing. How other people build their pools and where they locate them, which, as you can see, is some pretty interesting locations. Um, and then sometimes you can swim in open water and uh, see whale sharks, or uh, we can talk about sharks later because that always comes up in any talks I give. People are like fascinated with you know my encounters with sharks, and I have had them, so we can talk about that later. Um, and then next, I guess we can talk about um, some tips to getting started. Are, are most of you here? already well-versed swimmers? Like how many, just by a show of hands, can like swim a few laps and occasionally do it for, for fitness or for fun? Okay, good, and how many are kind of just starting and uh, wanting to learn the basics? One, okay, cool, well we're gonna please everybody here, so that's good to know. Um, basically, um, this is probably more directed towards you. Um, my recommendation would be if, if you're completely new to the sport, and maybe even if you're not, um, join a local YMCA or gym with pool access. I'm not recommending um, a city pool or a public pool because it can be intimidating early in the morning because you have lots of different programs renting pool space and the lanes are crowded. Really try to find um, a pool where you can have one-on-one -on -one, uh, training with someone. Um, and this goes for improving your stroke as well. So it doesn't just apply to beginners, but people that want to really um, improve on their technique. Um, consider hiring a swim instructor for a few lessons. 
Uh, if you know how to swim already, consider a master's program. So the next step, once you know the basics um, with maybe some one-on-ones, is to join a team, you know, an organized environment, uh, an organized uh, coaching environment that will stimulate you with other people and uh, organize workouts with intervals and sets and, you know, uh, a way to create a good training uh, situation for you. Uh, find a friend and commit to three times a week. This is very, very important. I find that any type of exercise that you commit yourself to, if you don't do it with someone, it's very easy to slack off and kind of just say, eh, you know, I'll take the day off, I'll do it again tomorrow. But if there's somebody else there pushing you, and if you have somebody you look forward to seeing every day and doing it with, um, it makes it a lot easier, especially in that initial startup stage. Um, have patience, you need to crawl before you can walk. I was gonna insert like a really bad swimming pun in here, but um, <laughs> for the sake of brevity, um, don't expect major improvements to happen overnight. Don't even expect them to happen in six to eight weeks. You know, usually when you talk about weight loss, people say, well, give yourself six to eight weeks until you really see a difference. With swimming, it's probably double or triple that. Give yourself anywhere from three to six months to see any improvements, whether it's speed, technique, um, we can talk about weight loss a little bit if any of you have, have that goal, but swimming is not probably the best exercise for weight loss. That was not one of my uh, advantages to swimming because what happens is if you haven't done it or if you're a relatively sedentary person and you just start swimming all of a sudden, your appetite increases because you're using every single muscle group and you start eating to compensate for, for this new challenge that your body's facing. And sometimes if you don't monitor that carefully, you're caloric intake, even though it feels like you're exhausting yourself in the pool, you might be swimming for 15 or 20 minutes, but you know the amount of calories that you consume following that swim can actually put weight on. But if you learn to monitor that and control your appetite, as you're starting the swim and you do it in moderation three times a week or so, within three to six months, you may not lose weight, but you'll notice a, a, definite, uh, a definite difference in your toning and your overall body shape. You know, things might change. You might not lose the weight, but it might be different weight distribution. So just wanted to throw that out there for anybody that might think that swimming is the way to lose weight. For me, when I pack around a few extra pounds around the holidays, the first thing I do is start running. Because it's out of my comfort zone. It's something different than swimming every day. And I incorporate that into my schedule maybe twice a week, maybe three times a week. And within six to eight weeks, the running helps me lose the few pounds I want. But it's also matched with uh, food intake moderation. You know, everything is sort of, it's very simple. Like all these different diets, like paleo and, um, uh, zone diet and you know before that it was like don't eat fat don't eat meat don't eat this don't eat that you can eat what you want but the basic formula is less in more out so you know you consume 2,000 calories try to burn 2,100 calories I mean it's a rough figure but you know what I mean like that's kind of how you'll achieve your weight loss goals and of course you can't operate in negative caloric intake as I said to somebody before the start I'm not like a a nutritionist, so I'm not going to uh, preach this as if I know what I'm talking about, but um, you can't operate on negative caloric intake, meaning like you really shouldn't be eating less calories than you're burning. Like you need calories to live, you need calories to just breathe and sleep, so don't try to be that careful about it. But if you're having trouble losing weight and you consume, let's say, 3,000 calories a day, just try consuming 2,800 calories a day and give yourself three months to lose the weight. And it'll come off, I guarantee you. Um, Is there any science to that? Because I notice that too. When I'm swimming, I'm hungry. Mm -hmm. When I run, I sometimes lose my appetite or Absolutely. have less of a you know, yeah. desire to eat. Running like really jars your body, so um, I lose my appetite too, which is kind of a good thing. But then yeah. it comes back stronger later. I don't know. But I know that when I'm done swimming in the morning, I come here and I'm ravenous. And so yeah. like, my largest meal is usually breakfast. Um, with the master's program, where, how would you, like for uh, this area, what would you recommend for LA? Like just Google it, I, guess, I think SCAC has a master's SCAC, program. Southern California Aquatic Masters is probably the biggest and they have the most flexible um, of the schedules because they are the biggest. They have pools all over town. There's Santa Monica College, there's Culver City Plunge, there's Westwood, there's Venice, I believe. So they're everywhere and they're like three times a day. Like they have a morning workout, a noon workout, and an after work workout. So they're probably like, the best resource in terms of just convenience, but depending on where everybody lives, there's, there's usually master's programs within reach of just about any community. Um, Burbank may be the only one that doesn't have one that I know of, but they're even talking about starting up a program there for anybody that lives out in the valley. Yeah? 
How did you make the transition from swimming in the pool to swimming in the ocean? I, like, I started surfing, and it's like my biggest issue with surfing is like I get killed by the waves, and then like <laughs> fighting the waves, and then like trying to hold onto my board, trying to get my swimming strong, trying to catch a wave at the same time. I just get killed, like you know. I'm just that's a really good question, yeah. and it was not an easy or overnight transition for me. Um, I moved to California in '93 and I had just been a pool swimmer, and I was actually teaching swimming as sort of just a, a side thing for fun. And some of my swimmers said, oh, you should come and do this open water race, and I'd never heard of that or, or done it, and that's where I went to Seal Beach and got thrown by the waves and was really humbled by this experience because I had people beating me that were not as fast as I was, but that just knew what they were doing in the ocean. Mm -hmm. So um, it's a lot of it is exposure. <laughs> You know, you can't expect to go to an open water swim and, and unless the conditions are glassy, you know, you, you have to expect the unexpected. And um, one thing I can get uh, into a little later, um, I believe it's on one of the other slides, is that uh, if you are preparing for a race uh, in open water, try to mimic that entire scenario in the days leading up to it, either the day before or even the week before. Go to the location. Suss it out, you know. Um, try swimming without your goggles in case they get knocked off on race day. Um, expose yourself to those elements on more than one occasion. It's it's even part of your training. And I probably should practice what I preach more because I generally prefer and only train in pools right now. But I've done enough open water swims where I feel like I know the elements and the conditions around me. But I could probably stand to improve a lot if I were to train more in open water. It's just not really all that convenient. They do, it, to me. they do it on Sunday mornings um, at Santa Monica Pier, do a mile swim out yeah. every Sunday morning. And there's a, there's a few groups that go to Hermosa Manhattan as well, and oh. they, they do that peer-to-peer -peer swim. But I read somewhere in the paper or somewhere online recently that there's now going to be um, a fining situation. Like they'll fine you if you're in groups of three or more because it's what? considered an organized swim and they don't want people going out without certified lifeguards or whatever, but then that encourages people to swim alone, which is even worse, so I don't know. <laughs> if, you, uh, if you just keep your eyes and ears open about whatever's going on, and I don't know much about it, it literally flared up last week, somebody told me, so that was news to me. But, um, I definitely highly recommend going down to the beach with a friend or a lake or whatever open body of water you find yourself wanting to compete or swim in, and exposing yourself to that regularly, um, you know, and, and facing your fears, you know, like for me, big surf was something that I dreaded and after that first bad experience I had getting tumbled and losing my goggles and kind of even being disoriented and literally for the first time in my life feeling like I was going to drown you know I made it a point to expose myself to that regularly and I went to the beach you know on the weekends after that for, for the entire summer and I just got used to um, to the surf and, and how to navigate those conditions and the conditions always change so no matter how much training you do in the ocean you could show up one day and the swells could be twice as big as you've ever seen them. Or it could look really calm, but there's a fierce undertow and your goggles get knocked off or you get elbowed in the face and you're swimming with a bloody nose. Like, anything can happen. So really, you just have to expect the unexpected and be prepared for that. And anything you can do in leading up to the event or uh, to be comfortable in the water, the more you can do in preparation for that by mimicking that experience, the less likelihood of panic there will be. Um, on after the race day. I just recently got certified for diving because I I'd been doing all the swimming and I'd never had a dive certification and I wanted to have the opportunity to, to you know, see sea life and, and get down there and hold my breath under, or be able to breathe underwater. So I got certified, but one of the first things they did in the first um, class was take you to the bottom of the pool with all your equipment on and have you take off your mask and then put it back on with the, um, you know, and clear it so that you could see again and take your, um, regulator in your uh, tank off with your back and then pull it around in front of you and put it back on. And I was like, when are you ever going to be in a condition where you're going to have your tank taken off your back? It's literally strapped on. And they're like, no, we just want you to be comfortable and understand the equipment and know where everything is and get a sense of it. And that really is kind of what I'm trying to impart to you on as far as swimming goes. It's the same thing. Just try to get comfortable with all the different things that, that are on your person and, and different things you might face and, and feel. You know, the temperature is a huge thing. Like, swimming in Southern California is not, you know, what it looks like on Baywatch. Like, the water can get cold. So, the yeah, more you actually expose yourself to that, the more conditioned you'll be. You know, even just getting in the water three times before an event, 
um, on three separate occasions for, for a short training swim will help you um, acclimate to, to the cold. Otherwise, you could get hypothermic a lot easier. There's a race I do in Tiburon every September, which is Northern California, and it's like 55 degrees. And so in leading up to that race, especially the day before, I get in the water and I just sit in the water. I don't even exercise. I just get up to the water, up to here, and sit there for 10 minutes and tell myself I'm not cold so that the next day when I do the race at 6 in the morning, I know what to expect. And it really helps. I mean, maybe it's psychological, but for me, that's what works. Are you allowed to wear wetsuits for that race, or is it? Not you can't. No. You can't. No, there's a wetsuit division, but I guess there's still races without wetsuits. Yeah. Yeah. More and more, like they're they're discouraging wetsuits, or they have a separate division now. So, um, you know, and I have nothing against wetsuits. I own like three different pairs, and I use them in races where it's allowed or where it's permissible, and I prefer it actually. But you know. In a lot of races, you don't have that luxury. What's the time advantage for somebody like as fast as you are with swimming a distance, say 800 meters wetsuit without the wetsuit? What, what Actually, that's a good question too. I tried that last year for the first time because I had been asked that before. And um, if per 100 meters, it's anywhere from two to four seconds difference. So in a one mile swim, it would be about a minute difference mm -hmm. with a wetsuit. It's a huge difference, actually. Um, yeah, then there's the, obviously the, the less experienced or slower swimmer would, would gain even more by the wetsuit because they're, they're Possibly. more straight in the if water. If they're slow to begin with, then the wetsuit may not, it will help their buoyancy, but it wouldn't necessarily help their propulsion through the water. Mm. Um, you know, and I think, I don't know that it would be two to four seconds difference per 100 meters. It might be eight seconds difference, or it might be just one second difference. I think it really depends on it, body it type. Depends, yeah. Yeah, but for me, it, um, it, I felt like it was a really big difference, although I don't like the constriction I feel with the wetsuit. So another thing is if you are competing and you are opting to wear a wetsuit, make sure you try it on before the race and get in a pool or preferably the body of water that you're swimming in. There's so many people I know that, oh yeah, I've got a wetsuit now I'm gonna wear it on race day, and they go and then they find out that it's a size too small or they've never felt it before, so it, they feel like they can't breathe and they have this panic attack because the wetsuit's tightening in on their chest, but that's exactly how a wetsuit's supposed to feel. You have to get used to wearing it. It's not just like putting on a bathing suit and jumping in the water. There's a whole different, it's a whole different ball game, so. Nothing new on race day. Nothing new on race day, exactly. Good, good lesson to keep in mind. Um, I think I've covered all those points on this page, except for practice moderation and training and diet and new patterns. If, you're, if you are starting out um, with a new training regimen or uh, a new diet or, or anything involving um, your swimming or your exercise, do it in moderation. Don't expect, you know, Rome was not built in a day, to use another cliche. Just give yourself the time and, and step into it gently, you know, dip a toe in the water, as it were. Um, I know a lot of people that want to really get good at swimming and, and they want immediate results and they think if they swim two hours a day like I do, you know, and cover 40 miles a week that they're going to be at my level within a month's time and it just doesn't work that way you know I've put in 40 years and I'm still improving and I'm still learning and so I tell people you know practice moderation don't try to do it all at once because you'll get injured or you'll burn out or you just won't even enjoy it and what's the point of doing it if you don't enjoy it um, but even doing 15 or 20 minutes a day of a new activity in the water whether it's stroke technique or a different drill or um, you know uh, breath control hypoxic work uh, just doing little things in moderation like that can really